Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Baha'i Chat with Rain Wilson. As you can see, I'm not Rain. We'll get to him in a second. But my name is Liz Dwyer, and I'm a writer and editor living in Los Angeles. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be your MC for this informal conversation series with Rain that's dedicated to our interconnectedness. I think it's safe to say that we can all pretty much agree that we can use some uplifting moments these days to help us turn our thoughts to more spiritual ideas and concepts. And then of course, consider how we apply those ideas to transforming our personal lives, our families and our communities around us. Each of these conversations for Baha'i Chat and these conversations with Rain are rooted in the writings of the Baha'i faith and its fundamental teachings in the oneness of God, the harmony of all religions, and the harmony and unity of, of humanity. So this program is just one hour, including Q&A, and that's a lot to cover in just one hour, so we're not gonna obviously talk about all of it, but um, you'll be able to type questions in the Q&A box that's available in Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Another thing for you to know is we're st live streaming today's conversation on Facebook. So you can find a link for that live stream in the chat box down at the bottom of your Zoom view. And you can share it right now if you want to with your friends and family on Facebook by clicking on the link provided in the chat, which will take you to the Baha'i Chat Facebook page where you can simply select share. Before we get started, just to get it on your calendar, Baha'i Chat, if you don't know, hosts lots of different conversations about various aspects of the Baha'i faith and, like I said, interconnectedness. So the next Baha'i Chat is actually going to be on Saturday, March 13th at 2.15 Eastern, but we'll get more to that later. And then the other thing is that, um, yeah, I think that's that's... I think that's it for now. We'll tell you some more other stuff, but uh, let's get into it. Why not? Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my good friend and uh, old neighbor, uh, Rain Wilson. He, as you all know, he's an American actor, comedian, writer, director, businessman, and producer who is best known for his role as the amazing Dwight Schrute on NBC's sitcom, The Office, for which he earned three consecutive Emmy Award nominations for Outstanding Supporter, Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. So welcome, Rain Wilson. Let's see if we got him on here yet. There he is. Boom. Boom. Happy last day of Black History Month. What's up? Thank you. Happy last day of Black History Month to you. All right, all on, right. On that, on that note, what should we know? What, do you have a tidbit for us today? Give us a little uh, soupçon okay. of um, Black History Month. Yes, okay, so the- On its the last moment, day. Yes. The most important thing that I have been learning and talking with folks about during Black History Month was that actually Carter G. Woodson, who started it as Negro History Week, um, it was actually supposed to be a week that everyone could talk about all of the things that they learned about Black history throughout the rest of the year. So we should really take it upon ourselves to this is just the jumping off point for us to learn all the other things about Black history. And then next year, maybe we can we can we can have a pop quiz on that. So that's fantastic. I think we need Black History Year, uh, yeah. and um, that's History that's a better Black way to go. Um, Liz, thanks so much. Um, I've known I've known you for a long time. Do you know that we met like twenty one years ago? Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. When I was when I was twelve, and you were like how old? No. <laughs> Dude, you honestly, you still look like you're twenty eight. So. Hey, you know, LA, an LA girl at heart. I love this. Thank you. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. So, um, thank you, uh, all 68 people who have joined us here at Baha'i Chat. Um, they've done a really uh, great thing um, with Baha'i Chat. Uh, David Hoffman, the founder, Josephina, like Liz said, and uh, they have lots of great chats, some more formal presentations, some not. Um, a lot of upcoming ones having to do with racial justice, which is a big part of the Baha'i world and work. So uh, very pleased to be here. We're gonna try a little experiment of just me coming on once a month and having a little informal dialogue about the Baha'i faith or about spiritual ideas and whatnot. So um, the title of tonight's talk, I don't really like titles so much, but is why I am a Baha'i because I thought this would be a good kind of introduction um, uh, to the Baha'i faith and for me to speak a little bit personally about 
uh, my history and experience. And, you know, why is this weird sitcom actor with a chess hat um, talking about this religion I've never heard of or rarely heard of or what have you? By the way, I'm wearing this because I just literally, I'm not kidding you, 50 minutes ago finished playing in a celebrity chess tournament. Um, in which I came in second. So it wasn't like the Queen's Gambit. It was like the Baha'i's Gambit. Um, but I lost to a 22-year-old French guy named Sardoche. Sacre bleu. Um, so folks, let's get going. Um, this is the quote that I'm anchoring the talk with. And um, by the way, I'm not a member of the clergy. There's not any clergy in the Baha'i faith. So I'm just a regular you know, actor, Liz is a writer. Um, and what I'm stating is just my personal opinion. This is not anything um, official by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm just gonna be sharing from my heart a few quotes, a few ideas, a few stories, and then we'd love to open it up for questions and whatnot. So uh, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, and I'll get a little bit more into some of the basics. I don't wanna spend the entire talk just talking about basics about a very, complicated, rich, um, challenging, wonderful, nuanced, variegated world faith with six million adherents around the globe. I don't wanna just spend the whole time doing an intro. So this quote is by Baha'u'llah. That name means the glory of God. He's the founder of the Baha'i faith. Um, he lived in Persia, that's now Iran, in the mid 19th century for the most part. There's more to it than that, but that's, that's the bullet points version. He says, the betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds and through commendable and seemly conduct. The betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds and through commendable and seemly conduct. I, they put a little hope there in the blue thing in the corner. And th the reason that I put this quote up and I chose this quote is because we live in a pretty dark time and it seems to be getting a little darker as time goes along. And there's a lot of young people, I don't know how many folks are young in this, I can't really look at you, but there's a lot of hopelessness around there. There's, um, I remember growing up in the seventies and people would always talk about world peace. Like how can we achieve world peace? You know, how can we attain world peace? And now everyone is just like, ah, screw it. We'll never hit world peace. You know, let's just try and survive for a couple more generations or else the species needs to move to Mars, you know, the survivors and we're destroying this planet. Um, and there's a lot of legit talking that way. People feel like human nature can never change. Um, we're naturally uh, competitive and aggressive and warlike and we're never, we're only going to achieve this kind of detente, but we're not going to achieve kind of a totality of healing of the species moving to the next level share on this shared planet and healing some of the ills. So the betterment of the world can be achieved through pure and goodly deeds and through commendable and seemly conduct. What's important here, at first glance, it seems like, well, uh, okay, fine. But when you really start to um, unspool it, it's a little more complicated than that because it's saying the betterment of the world can be achieved. It is possible. We can make the world better through pure and goodly deeds. Well, we kind of know that. Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, right? We know these people that do pure and goodly deeds and make the world a better place. But Baha'u'llah also puts in this other caveat which I think is important to, um, to note, through commendable and seemly conduct. So these two things kind of go hand in hand. Sometimes in the outside world right now, you'll have a lot of people doing pure and goodly deeds, but they're kind of jerks around it. Um, some people might have very commendable and seemly conduct, but they're not doing pure and goodly deeds. So how do we balance both of these things? How do we, and by the way, this is not, this talk is not about converting you to the Baha'i faith. We certainly welcome people to join the Baha'i faith, but it's not really what it's about. It's about building community, like Liz said earlier. It's about building consultation and working together to better the world. And this is just one very small, very simple idea, a little kernel, 
pure and goodly deeds, commendable and seemly conduct. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith and um, this was in Seattle in the 1970s and uh, early 80s. And uh, there were a lot of amazing, wonderful things that I learned uh, personally as I was growing up a Baha'i. Here are some of the um, central ideas and teachings of the Baha'i faith, unity being kind of first and foremost, the most key idea, the foundational idea of unity of God, of religion, of humanity. What does that mean? The unity of God, that there's only one God, that we all worship one God. Now you may say, well, duh, everyone knows that, but that's not true. Because there's a lot of people that, for instance, a lot of fundamentalists that understand of any religion that understand God only at a, in a certain way through a certain lens. So um, they may not say that there's only one God. So only one religion, we'll get to that later, and only one humanity, that we're all one human family sharing this earth. And again, right now that may feel obvious, oh, duh, of course, but we still certainly struggle with that, don't we? In terms of, especially in terms of race um, and, and class and so many other, ways that were divided, nationality. Um, and when this religion emerged in the 19th century in the Middle East, uh, this was an absolutely revolutionary, crazy, crazy pants idea. The fact that there were one human family that was, that was just nuts. Um, equality of women and men, that was also a revolutionary concept in the mid 1800s. Now we're we still struggle with that, right? We still have big issues with that, paying women the same amount, empowering women in the same way. Um, the, the Me Too movement, um, the elimination of racial prejudice, we've referred to that before. That has to do with the humanity, with the uniting humanity and how uh, racial prejudice is uh, one of the great cancers eating away at our species and that if we want to get better, if we want to better the world, we have to eliminate racial prejudice. The harmony of science and religion, these are not two, uh, as they're often seen nowadays, two opposing forces, but two forces that work and need to work in harmony. The elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty, um, super important. This is something that a lot of people are talking about, you know, income inequality is a hot button topic these days. Well, Baha'u'llah and um, other Baha'is that founded the, the faith were talking about these issues for the last 150 years, universal education, another. So I'm bringing up, that's kind of a, uh, a potpourri of some of the key concepts in the Baha'i faith. There's many more than that. But so as a kid growing up, this was an amazing milieu to be in, to be learning all of this stuff at four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, I there was a very racially diverse Baha'i community in the Pacific Northwest in the 70s. There was a lot of singing. There was a lot of like kumbaya singing and um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, wonderful love and harmony among very diverse people. And that's, the, that's how I grew up. Um, we talked about the unity of religions. And this is a, a basic thing that I was taught as a kid, uh, this idea, this concept of progressive revelation. Um, the idea that there is one God and the way that this God has decided to educate humanity spiritually over the eons, over the centuries, is by sending down specially appointed divine teachers. We call them, some call them prophets, some call them messengers of God. The Baha'is use a phrase manifestations of God, which I kind of think sums it up very well. It's like God made manifest. And these are some of them in a handy dandy graphic with lots of bright colors, um, which is suitable for hanging on the wall of a preschool or a kindergarten. Um, Abraham, Krishna, Moses, Zoroaster, Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, and then the Bab and Baha'u'llah. I won't go into the Bab so much. He was the forerunner of Baha'u'llah. So this idea that there essentially all of the different religions on the planet are actually one religion coming from one source that just have different chapters, like different chapters of a book gradually unfolding. This is what I learned as a Baha'i kid. Um, so this is, um, this, is, this is the best Google search I could find of the kingdom of God on earth. So now we can put the graphic away. So 
the um, that shining gold city in the clouds was um, uh, it reminds me of a story that my father was a Baha'i and he passed away recently this last year. And uh, he was a great teacher. And as Baha'is, you know, we believe in the Bible and we believe in the Quran and we believe in the Bhagavad Gita and the writings of the Buddha. So when different folks of different religions would stop by, would they be invited in? So um, he, uh, you know, we had some born again Christians of, of some stripe that came by and he invited them in and said, let's have a Bible study. And we started, you know, studying the Bible and listening to what they had to say. And my dad asked about what is this kingdom of God on earth? What's your view? And they said, oh, well, in our worldview of our denomination, there's a rumbling and there's clouds in the sky and the clouds part and there's thunder and lightning, and beams of light shine down. And then this glimmering city of gold and silver will come down. Jesus is there with the horn. There's angels. And the saved people, the believers will go on the city and lift off to heaven and the rest of the people will be left on earth. And they said, what is the Baha'i view of um, the kingdom of God on earth? And my dad said, um, well, it's similar, it starts similar. There's clouds and rumbling, the clouds part, light shines down, heavenly angels, oh. But then down through the clouds come a bunch of bricks and mortar and hammers and nails and bags of cement. And then finally, an instruction manual floats down. It says, kingdom of God on earth, do it yourself, kit. So hence that graphic. That's the best graphic I could find to, <laughs> to summarize that story. That's a, a bunch of very intense. Uh, white people in hard hats talking about building something. So um, as you see here, you see a head filled with anxiety, stress, panic, depression, et cetera, like that. And what happened for me was in my personal story is a wonderful way to grow up. But when I went off to college in New York City uh, in the late 80s, I um, wanted nothing to do with religion anymore. I didn't want anything to do with God, morality. Religion felt so old fashioned. People who believed in God were like grandmothers you know, praying to some sky daddy that was going to take care of all of their issues. And um, I just didn't want anything to do with it. I was rebelling against my parents who were Baha'is. I wanted to go be an artist. I wanted to go uh, study acting in New York City, and uh, which I did. And basically, you know, I've talked about this in other talks before, and I've written about it in a book that I wrote and stuff like that. I won't go into like all of the details, but as I look back on it now, I realize that kind of what I went through in my mid late 20s was a lot of essentially mental health issues, which are uh, issues that a lot of young people are dealing with and suffering from right now. I think for a lot of older people, they hear mental health and they're like, they think like split personalities and psychosis and hearing voices and stuff like that. And that's certainly a very serious part of mental health issues. But what I'm talking about more was really crippling anxiety and depression. And um, I had anxiety attacks for many years that were that would render me like on the floor. Um, I was very depressed for a long period of time. And um, there's more to the story than that. But that kind of precipitated my journey back to looking toward faith, toward spirituality, towards religion. Because I thought, well, maybe I threw the baby out with the bathwater when I just jettisoned everything having to do with spirituality. Maybe the reason I'm so unhappy, depressed, anxious, overwhelmed, dealing with addiction struggles, maybe, maybe spirituality might be an answer that I might be looking for. So for me personally, um, again, super long story short, this is, you know, 12 years condensed into, into uh, 90 seconds. Um, I started exploring various faiths. I started really digging into this question of God. Like, did I believe in God? If so, how? After reading the Bible and the Quran and a lot of the other holy books of the world, I came back to the Baha'i writings and uh, I found some really uh, beautiful and important um 
writings. That helped me a great deal and reinvigorated and rekindled my faith that Baha'u'llah was the newest divine teacher for humanity and that the answers that I needed as a person, both on a personal level, um, psychological level, emotional level, and the answers that I needed on a more, that humanity needs on a more global level, on a, from a larger lens view, um, could be found in the Baha'i faith. So that's the title of the book, I mean, the talk, Why I Am a Baha'i. And this was a prayer that was very important to me. And I'm just going to say it right now. Um, you don't have to do anything fancy. I'm just going to say the prayer and you just listen to the words and I think you'll see what I mean. This was a, a prayer that brought me great solace at the time. It says, God, refresh and gladden my spirit, purify my heart, illumine my powers. I lay all my affairs in thy hand. Thou art my guide and my refuge. I will no longer be sorrowful and grieved. I will be a happy and joyful being. Oh God, I will no longer be full of anxiety, nor will I let trouble harass me. I will not dwell on the unpleasant things of life. Oh God, thou art more friend to me than I am to myself. I dedicate myself to thee, O oh Lord. There's a lot to unpack in this prayer. I'm looking at the time. There's a few more things I want to get across before we have the Q&A. So I'm not going to be able to go there. But this, like I said, was a, a prayer and there are many other writings in the Baha'i faith that brought, brought me a great deal of personal peace and solace and gave my life um, a certain meaning and a certain direction and uh, a certain healing that I found had been missing. One of the things I discovered about the Baha'i faith was the importance, as I went back to the Baha'i faith, was the importance of the arts in the Baha'i faith. And that I had been spending all this time studying, acting, working, I began acting, doing theater, getting paid butkus for doing a lot of little plays and, and whatnot. And the son of Baha'u'llah, the eldest son, was named Abdul Baha. He uh, was a great spiritual teacher and leader of the Baha'i faith for, for many decades. And he said in a letter to someone, I rejoice to hear that thou hast taken pains with thine art, for in this wonderful new age, art is worship. The more thou strivest to perfect it, the closer wilt thou come to God. What bestower, bestowal could be greater than this, that one's art should be even as the act of worshiping the Lord? That is to say, when thy fingers grasp the paintbrush, it is as if thou wert at prayer in the temple. This was mind blowing for me. I had always had this dichotomy like, well, here's my religion, and here's me doing acting and theater and trying to get into TV and make a living and, you know, transforming into characters, pretending to be other characters like Dwight and other characters. And um, here's this quote that's Again, foundational to the Baha'i faith, the idea that art in this age is worship. When you pick up the paintbrush, that's the same as kneeling in the temple. This was, this was mind blowing to me. All of those years I had spent working on my craft of being an actor and going to regional theaters and doing Shakespeare and bus and truck tours and um, doing workshops and studying with directors, like all of that was, was worship in the eyes of God. I, this was also greatly relieving to me. Another thing that I found um, was that uh, there was a, a central teaching of the Baha'i faith that I had kind of forgotten about or neglected. And this was the independent investigation of truth. And I apologize for this generic image of a dude on a, on a mountaintop. What can you do? You know, you're putting together a PowerPoint. You know how it goes. Like, I need someone like independently finding the truth. That's what I came up with. So, so sue me. Uh, but one of the most important teachings of the Baha'i faith is for us to find the truth for ourselves. This may sound again 
obvious in uh, 2021. Well, of course, duh, I found the truth for myself. Like, uh, you know, this, maybe I want to be a kayak instructor or maybe I want to be a Buddhist on the weekends or maybe I'm going to change my careers or maybe I'm going to go live on a kibbutz for a while and see what that's like. Like we're in this mode of finding the truth for ourselves. But again, in the 19th century, this was a revolutionary concept to explore the truth for oneself. You could do a whole talk on any one of these slides and you could talk for an hour on any one of these slides, but I'm kind of moving quickly through a lot of big ideas. But I think that this is so pertinent today uh, to find the truth for ourselves. Um, because a lot of what people take as true is what they read in the media and what they read on Twitter and what, you know, certain, you know, writers and newspapers believe and what the kind of general current cultural uh, context is. So we have to break all of that down. It's not just about like, find what religion you want to belong to. The independent investigation of truth is like, we're human beings, 7 billion of us on a planet. We're given about 70 to 100 years on this planet with our lives. Why? Why are we here? You can certainly believe that it's just a random confluence of molecules and atoms and that there's not any meaning to it other than the meaning you find to yourself. A lot of people live that way. That's fine. That doesn't really hold water for me. So it's like, well, well, why? Why am I here? What's the point of all of this? What is the point of our society and our planet and this beautiful universe and all of these different religious faiths and all of these different teachings? Um, and I realized that that's what I had done. I had gone on this journey. I had left the Baha'i faith. I had gone on my odyssey toward art. I had gone on my mental health journey. And I had come back around to believing in the Baha'i faith and that this was greatly supported in my faith as finding the truth for myself. And I'm. it was really dark times and it was dangerous times, but I'm really grateful for the experience because ultimately I came out with like a, a deeper, more renewed, uh, unshakable faith. So again, why am I a Baha'i? That's some of my backstory. Um, one of the things that I learned recently as um, it's pretty obvious, it's pretty basic. But for me, it was a big light bulb. There's a series of books called the Ruhi books, or Ruhi courses. And um, they're a quite interesting way to learn and study about the Baha'i faith with uh, facilitators and friends. And some are about prayer and some are about life after death and some are about service in your community. And one of the books is uh, about how to teach and empower junior youth and youth, uh, i.e. from 11 to 17 year olds, you know, right in there and how to work with them. And it, in that book, it talks about this twofold moral purpose that we have. And this is a, a key writing that's in a lot of the Baha'i teachings, but I mentioned that prayer, right? I mentioned that prayer of um, God, refresh and gladden my spirit. So that's in the yellow bubble personal path towards perfection of spiritual virtues, um, aka enlightenment. So I have, we all have our personal struggles, issues. There's between us and our creator, between us and our souls, the growth and development of our souls, how we find peace, how we found solace, how we connect to nature. Um, this is often the purview of a lot of religious faith and exploration these days. You know, I go to this yoga class, I hear some teachings from the Buddha. It gives me great peace. I feel connected to the people in the yoga class. I feel peace and calm. I go out in the world. It gives me hope and solace and it grounds me. It gives me some spiritual tools to use, whatever. Um, uh, so, but the other aspect, the other bubble of this twofold moral purpose is selfless service to humanity, social justice, working and fighting for social justice, community building, there's many, many more things, but that we have a purpose, we have a responsibility to try and make the world a better place. So this, this for me kind of encapsulated um, why I am a Baha'i, like, oh, right. I'm gonna work on myself. I'm gonna try and be a better person. I'm gonna try and be kinder, more compassionate, more humble, more honest, more loving, 
you know, all the qualities of the divine, the qualities that we love and in, in people and great leaders and, and those that are closest to us. And at the same time, I'm also going to work towards making the world a better place and helping humanity. The betterment of the world can be achieved through pure and goodly deeds. And let's go to the next one. Is there a next one? Um, okay, great. Um, uh, let's go back one. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that's, I think that's from another presentation, which is super important. I don't wanna, Liz will be mad at me if I'm gonna skip. So let's go back, let's go back. Liz is gonna be really mad at me if I skip over this. So this was not part of my, this was I think, part of a different presentation of mine, but it's here, the slide came up, let's do it. And this is uh, very much for me, you know, why I am a Baha'i. One of the things is, uh, the thing uh, I maybe hate worse in the world is is racial prejudice and um, and racial disunity, and it's uh, it is a cancer all over the world, but especially in this country, and where you have a great deal of resistance and denial around this issue. And uh, this is a quote from who is this? Baha'is of the United States from the. National Administrative Body of the Baha'is in the United States, racial prejudice, the most vital and challenging issue we face as a country. This is a one of the key teachings of, um, of the Baha'i faith. And uh, there's, there's so much to in, explore and unpack in it. But going again towards that twofold moral purpose, what you'll find is a lot of Baha'is working to make the world a better place and doing this by tackling racial injustice and racial disunity and fighting prejudice, perhaps not in exactly the same way as some other people that might use more political, um, you know, a political party or a candidate or whatever to, to tackle uh, the issue, but through spiritual tools. So we'll get to more on that later. The next quote is a big one. Um, this is a big one. Okay, so bear with me. Then we're going to finish up very quickly. The key to resolving these social ills. This is from the Universal House of Justice. So I said there's no clergy in the Baha'i faith. So we could do a whole thing on the Baha'i administration, but basically every locality elects a council of people to oversee its affairs. And the nation elects a council of people to oversee its affairs. And the world elects a council of people to oversee the affairs of the Baha'is and the world, and that is called the Universal House of Justice. And they write wonderful letters and quotes and um, are greatly, deeply heeded by the Baha'is. And I thought that the way that this was summated, is that a word? I don't know, uh, was really exceptional. This is a quote from a letter from the Universal House of Justice. The key to resolving these social ills rests in the hands of a youthful generation convinced of the nobility of human beings. So this is kind of a recap of kind of who Baha'is are and what they do. And when I read this, I'm like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna get on this train. The key to resolving these social ills rests in the hands of a youthful generation convinced of the nobility of human beings, eagerly seeking a deeper understanding of the true purpose of existence, able to distinguish between divine religion and mere superstition, clear in the view of science and religion as two independent yet complementary systems of knowledge that propel human progress, conscious of and drawn to the beauty and power of unity in diversity. That's one of the key concepts that we can use to help heal racial injustice, the idea of unity and diversity. Um, the many flowers of a garden. Thank God we don't have a garden filled with carnations because that would be it would suck and be boring. But we need diversity for so many reasons, not just for, for the beauty of diversity, but diversity of thought and culture and way of doing things and insight. Um, it's harder that way, but it's so vital. Secure in the knowledge that real glory is to be found in service to one's country and to the peoples of the world 
and mindful that the acquisition of wealth is praiseworthy only insofar as it is attained through just means and expended for benevolent purposes, for the promotion of knowledge and toward the common good. So the acquisition of wealth is praiseworthy only insofar as it attained through means, through just means and expended for benevolent purposes, for promotion of knowledge toward the common good. Thus must our precious youth prepare themselves to shoulder the tremendous responsibilities that await them. And thus will they prove immune to the atmosphere of greed that surrounds them and press forward unwavering in their pursuit of their exalted goals. So that kind of gives a nice overview of some of these, how some of those beliefs that I described uh, having grown up with as a young Baha'i in the seventies in Seattle kind of can be put into action and how important they are. Let's move forward. Here's a non-Baha'i quote, love great Buckminster Fuller, great thinker, designer, architect, philosopher. Um, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So it's another reason why am I a Baha'i? Because that's what Baha'is are trying to do all around the world. We're trying to build a grassroots uh, kingdom of God on earth um, with people of various races and diversities and uh, genders uh, working together and uh, uh, to create something new and beautiful based on spiritual ideas. And coming back to this final quote, the betterment of the world can be accomplished with pure and goodly deeds through commendable and seemly conduct. So I wanted to bring us back to that keystone quote. So that is my 32 minute version of why I am a Baha'i. A lot of ideas in there. Again, you could spend half an hour on each one of the ideas I brought up, but I wanted to kind of give an overview. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I think maybe we'll have some Q&A chats for a little while. That was great. And you know, that, that, that rogue slide that ended up there, they say everything happens for a reason. So, you know, right? Black History Month, it was like, we better, you know, get on this. So, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So we have, if you all came in a little bit late, there's a Q&A box down at the bottom of, of your screen on Zoom. And if you're looking on Facebook, head over to the Zoom and then you can type questions in. We're going to try to get it to as many of these as we can. And there are definitely some really weighty ones here. Okay, so first question comes from Kendall Choi. And he wants to know, how would you say this belief would appeal to people that come from a Christian background? You want me to take this one? Yeah, that's not, that's that, that you can answer that in like 30 seconds, right? So. Well, it sounds like you've got a good answer for it. You take it in 30 seconds. Well, it's interesting because what you were saying about service and the, the, the dual purpose, I feel is very much in line with Christianity because as we know, Jesus was a servant to people, you know, mm -hmm. spent so much of his time doing that. So, so that was the first thing that came to mind is this, that dual purpose of, of building up your spiritual qualities that you have, but then translating them into the action piece, I think is something that's very in line with the concept of love thy neighbor. What is love? We know love is an action verb, right? Right. So translate it into action. That was the well first said. Line. That was more than 30 seconds, but that was great. We should have a talk show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to say that we talked about progressive revelation. So I think that for Christians to understand, if there's Christian friends out there, um, to understand that Baha'is revere the Lord Jesus Christ, revere Jesus, pray to Jesus, with Jesus, read the writings of Jesus and the, and the words of the Bible. And the Bible is a holy book in the Baha'i's eyes. So in that sense, too, I think that uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, Con there's a great connection there that to investigate the Baha'i faith doesn't mean discarding Jesus at all. It might mean shifting a perspective about Jesus in, in certain small regards. I would say small, some might say vast, 
Um, but yeah, so I think there is a, a connection, but it's also honestly one of the reasons why I am a Baha'i. It's also appealing to people of lots of different faiths. So. Along the lines of, of the theme of Christianity, Charity Whedon wants to know, do Baha'is have a text like the Bible? Uh, yes. So the Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, wrote hundreds of books and tablets and prayers and writings and meditations and um, quotes and uh, holy, holy writings. So there's not a book, a one book per se that is like, oh, here is the book. You could kind of say the Bible of the Baha'i faith is all of the writings of Baha'u'llah. There are certain key books. Um, uh, one is called the Kitabi Akdas. It's a book of like laws um, and um, kind of a how-to book for the Baha'i community. But there's also a book called The Gleanings, which is a compilation of a lot of his writings uh, that was put together by a, a great leader of the Baha'i faith named Shoghi Effendi. So there's a lot to choose from. There's writings that are mystical and again, about that personal connection between us and the creator. And then there are writings that are um, more about transforming the, the world and humanity. Let's see, there is a question. Uh, Mindy Molinari says she's always been curious about Baha'i but never pursued it. And she was, she's been an ethical vegan since 1982. And she's always leaned towards Buddhist principles, but she's not a Buddhist. And she says, from what I gather, the Baha'i faith is based in love and peace for all, and she wants to know more. Do you have any thoughts about that in terms of, of people who are coming from uh, a Buddhist path of, of, of spirituality and religion and how that connects to Baha'i belief? Yeah, I, I, I do. It's interesting. Um, uh, Maybe you do as well, Liz. The, the one thing that comes to mind for me is uh, when I read the bi writings of the Buddha and I try and make sure that they're writings from the Buddha because there's a lot of like misquoted Buddha writings, but I read like the Dhammapada. Um, it's, it brings me such peace and solace and clarity. You know, when I'm realizing that the source of my misery is my grasping, um, my ego wanting more, wanting to control outcomes, um, that surrendering uh, the need to grasp and to clutch and to control is uh, where you know peace lives. That suffering is a part of life, and that there's this constant battle between suffering, clutching, letting go, peace, suffering again, clutching, clutching, suffering. Like there's this. Uh, it, it helps me so much personally. And I think too, as you dig into the writings of the Buddha and the stories of the Buddha even deeper than what you kind of get um, on like the Pinterest version of Buddhism is actually there's a lot of teachings of the Buddha that have to do with serving humanity and changing our behaviors to make the world a better place. And I think um, they're in great, those are not uh, explored as much, I think in the Western idea of Buddhism, but uh, it's, it's, it's greatly profound. Yeah. I, I appreciate so much that you, you say that. I mean, I think it's, that's that piece of what the Buddha talked about in the essence of religion is about the practices that ease suffering and bring people closer together in communities and to salvation is like a, if you think about the cultures that the Buddha came to, they're very collective communities. We think of it as an individualistic sort of lens about these things, and it's not that. So, yeah, well said, and and I I think too that um, uh, going back, someone said it was Christian, and this is someone interested in Buddhism. Most Baha'is, people that become Baha'is, were something before they were a Baha'i. They weren't just kind of like uh, nothing, just a Buddhist or they're a Jewish or they're a Christian. And by being a Baha'i, you're not getting rid of that. You be a Baha'i and a Buddhist. You can be a Baha'i and a Christian. To be a Baha'i and a Muslim, um, it, it is very incorporating of those belief systems. A lot of questions that are about, were you saying that all the gods are the same or does Baha'i have a specific God? And then, um, and then there's another, that's from Patrick Harrington and another one from Trevor Wolf wants to know, how can we be following God and have the unity of faith when a person clearly, clearly rejects one of the messengers of God? Um, 
So I think that gets a bit yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, and I'm seeing a couple comments to uh, Liz, which are really interesting. An anonymous person says, uh, how can you believe in God or gods? There's only one. Uh, how long Christ believed there are messiahs, but Jews believe the messiah is still yet to come. That's not the same. And it's it's interesting too. Like I was, I had done a, a talk or a, a paper or something about the Baha'i faith and someone was very incensed and they were Hindu. And they said, Baha'is believe that Krishna is one of these prophets of God or messengers of God, but we believe Krishna is a God. And this is offensive to us. This is how we see it. We're not in alignment. Yeah, so for a lot of Christians, not all, but for a lot of Christians believe that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and doesn't don't look or are not able to see God in any other context than that. So there are certainly variations of belief among religions. Um, but Baha'is believe that the essence, the essence of the teachings of these holy prophets, these holy manifestations of God is the same. There is only one God. This God is known, you know, in Hinduism through all of these different faces and all of these different shapes and forms. In Buddhism, it doesn't really talk about God, but it does talk about enlightenment and nirvana and, you know, achieving something beyond this mere material existence. You know, in Christianity, I mean, you compared nirvana to salvation. In Christianity, it's salvation, believing in Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior accepting him uh, has us go to heaven and the same with the Muslims. We, we believe that humanity has shifted these interpretations. And so there are many disagreements uh, around different religions, um, but in its essential, uh, at, at its core to, in, to the Baha'i, it's all about one God, one love, building unity, building community, realizing that we're in this material world for a short amount of time, that our, we have a soul, there's more to this world than just the material, that our soul will travel and journey. These are universals that are shared among all the world's religions. All right, let's see. It's interesting. Charity Whedon asks, how does being a Baha'i impact your daily life? Like, do you have any daily spiritual practices that you do? Um, yeah, so Charity, thanks for asking. So again, for me, it gives, for me personally, and I would love to ask Liz what this means to her. Uh, for me personally, it's that twofold moral path. So, you know, I still deal, for instance, with anxiety, with great, great anxiety. And every day, my, part of my practice as a Baha'i is to pray and meditate. And uh, this gives me great calm and serenity, peace, and focus. Um, also, part of my life is, hey, how can I make the world a better place? What is my role to play into making the world a better place? Whether that's philanthropy, charity, education, service, what, whatever that means, um, how can I do my utmost to uh, help uplift people that need uplifting? So both of these things give meaning, clarity, purpose uh, to my life. And my life, I find, is greatly enriched through these teachings and through those twin points of focus, this kind of yin and yang dance between those two spiritual ideas. Liz, what about you? It's a great question. Well, one of the things that, one thing I think it's, it's I always was really interested and fascinated about in the Baha'i faith is that there are, there's no sort of traditions and very few rituals. I think just around like, for example, there's like a verse you say when you get married, there's prayers that you need to say when, you know, at someone's funeral who's a Baha'i. Um, but we do have obligatory prayers uh, that we say every day. So there's, there's, you have different options, which I also liked. Um, so there is a long one that you can say anytime during 24 hours. There is a medium one that you can say, and then there's a short one that you can say as long as you say before sunset. I was always a fan of the short one, which, you know, to each their own. But I, I ever since I was, I can remember making sure that I say that prayer. Um, there's also a verse in the Baha'i writings about, um, it says, bring thyself to account each day. And so at the end of every day, 
I try to remember to, to take some time for reflection. And a lot of folks do this, you know, thinking about your day, what did you do to it? Did you manage to have some way of, of bringing good into the world and being of service to people and bringing love and unity to other folks' lives or to your own? And where did I fall short and how can I do better the next day? Um, for me, those are, those are processes that are just like an ongoing sort of thing of like, it's, it's you know, if, I'm, if I, we're trying to build, as you said, Rain, that kingdom of God on earth, like there's a part of that, that part of that cycle of just constant, constant learning. Um, I think in that regard, that's a, that's a couple things that, that really come to mind for me, so. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, okay, let's see, what other? Uh, well, Ceci, Ceci Gonzalez says, uh, how do you celebrate Ayami Ha and what does it mean? So uh, that's great. The, we are in the last day of Ayami Ha right now. Uh, it is a Baha'i festival. We um, celebrating um, uh, life. It's a festival of gift giving, celebration, and also service. And it comes right before the Baha'i fast. So we're getting into that. It starts tomorrow morning. So Baha'is have a fast. Some of all, all faith traditions have a fast as part of their belief system, but the Baha'i fast starts tomorrow and it's for 19 days. No, don't freak out. That doesn't mean we're not eating and drinking for 19 days. It just means that when the sun is up, we don't eat or drink. Um, so we usually, you know, get up before the sun rises, have some food and drink. And then, uh, when the sun sets, have some food and drink. And it's a really intense time of, uh, prayer and meditation and, um, reflection. Um, so the, this is Ayame has the celebration right before that. This question is, um, what do Baha'is believe about death? in the afterlife from Devin Ramey. What do Baha'is believe about death and the afterlife? So uh, one of my favorite topics, as a matter of fact. Um, the If you hear weird water sounds, it's because my dogs are drinking, lapping up gallons of water in the background. Um, the um, the uh, Baha'is believe that we uh, are a soul. Uh, our reality is spiritual. We are souls. We are souls that are, are attached to, connected with a corporal existence, a body that uh, e exists on this planet for, if we're lucky, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, something like that. And our soul continues on its journey. Uh, there are tons of writings in the Baha'i faith about the Baha'i view of life after death and the journey of the soul through infinite worlds of God until we all meet our creator. So there's not the same concept as there is in the Abrahamic faiths about hell, especially Christianity and Islam. Um, there's not a fiery pit of burning uh, pain for non-believers. Um, everyone continues their spiritual journey. Um, hell can be a state of mind. It can be a distance from God. It can be great unhappiness. It can be great selfishness and egotism. Um, but uh, essentially everyone after this physical life goes forward into some form of, call it heaven, Baha'is call it the Abha kingdom, the kingdom of glory through infinite, infinite worlds of God. There's, maybe that'll be my next uh, topic for this talk. Cause I, my father, like I said, passed away about six, seven months ago and got me thinking a lot and researching a lot and praying a lot about uh, life after death. Is there anything you want to add to that, Liz? Um, I would just add that, you know, so, so many of us have family members who have passed away recently, you know, because of the, the coronavirus pandemic, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a, a topic that's on a lot of folks' minds. And for me, you know, when I've had folks who've died in the past, who are, I've been close to, particularly if they died tragically, this concept that the soul always makes progress has been something that's been incredibly comforting to me as I'm going through my own process of grieving. Um, the idea that, you know, 
like for example, if you like, I have had someone in my family who died by suicide, you know? So knowing that that person has the capacity to still develop spiritually and that it's, it's just not, it's not over for them, you know, is incredibly comforting. And it's, a uh, I don't know if I wasn't a Baha'i, if I would, would have that same sort of feeling or understanding. And it, it, not saying that people can't get to it in different ways, but uh, I know that's one thing that's always really resonated with me. Um, I think we have time, we're almost to the, to the hour mark. So I think we've got um, time for... Um, well, L, L. Grant uh, says, my late mother was a Baha'i, but I wanted to learn more about the Baha'i faith in her honor, what would you recommend for someone just getting into the Baha'i faith? Um, great question, you're in the right place. You know, there's a lot of online, uh, Liz works for Baha'iteachings.org, which has a lot of great essays and videos and interactive talks. Um, there's Baha'i.org is a great website. That's the official website of the Baha'i faith as well. These, there's regular Baha'i chats like this. And, um, you know, I think you can um, find some great uh, books to read and online. Uh, one book that I find really profound and, and moving and helpful is called The Hidden Words. And it's a series of really short meditations, almost like koans uh, about, the, um, about the human soul and the relationship to God and, um, and about our spiritual journey. Um, so that's a really beautiful place to go as well. Liz, do you have anything around that? Um, I think it, it definitely, I would say, you know, come over to, to Baha'iteachings.org. We got lots of content. It's just personal perspectives of various Baha'is um, and how they're applying the teachings of the faith to their lives. Um, but I would say in terms of books, definitely the hidden words. Uh, I've done my best to try to memorize some of them through over the years. Uh, um, but I, I think there's a, a prayer uh, in particular, it's, it's called the Tablet of Ahmad that I really, I really love. I don't know if you're starting out with it, it's maybe a little bit heavy, but um, I, I find some of the prayers to be incredibly moving and very soothing to me. Um, if you're coming from a Christian background, there's a book called uh, Thief in the Night, which is by a man named William Sears that I think is, is really excellent. And um, for me, answered lots of questions about the faith. Like what Rain said earlier about the independent investigation of truth, I find to be so critical. And as a you know journalist and just all around nerd who used to read the dictionary for fun, for me, knowing that the entire history of the Baha'i faith was documented by journalists was huge for me. Um, and that all of the things that happened throughout Baha'i history actually really happened mattered to me so much. So that there's that part of my brain that loves the very factual sort of thing, but then the mystical piece of the prayers and, and you know, like you said, the, the hidden words and how you can connect with, the, with those gems of spiritual insight, I find just profoundly moving. There's a lot more questions. I wish we could get to them all. Um, we're, yeah. I, I think, striving to do this on the last Sunday of every month yes. at 5 p.m. So hopefully Liz will be back with me. Yes, I'd love to come back. And just a couple announcements for folks. Um, as I shared earlier, a couple announcements. Um, the next Baha'i Chat will be March 13th at 2.15 p.m. Eastern, 11.15 Pacific. And it's actually gonna be a conversation with the editorial team at Baha'iteachings.org where I work. And we're gonna be talking about how we as writers and editors create a space for dialogue about race. Like how do you write about race and, and race unity and, and what we're all doing to try to get there in a healthy way um, and productive way that's action oriented and also reflective of reality. Um, and then the second thing is, cause I know there's a lot of questions I see in the chat that we you know, weren't able to, to get to right now, but if you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone like a virtual guide um, to answer your questions or, or point you in the, the right direction of a book that maybe was, was mentioned here today that you didn't quite get the title to or whatnot, uh, just shoot info at Baha'i.chat. Again, that's info at Baha'i.chat. Uh, and write guide in the subject line and someone will, will loop back with you um, 
And uh, I think that's that. So, all righty. Yeah, I put that um, info at Baha'i.chat. I love this idea of a Baha'i guide. If yeah. someone is looking, uh, just wants someone, uh, how do we put it? Just, just a helper to someone to ask questions to or bounce an email. Hey, what should I read? Or any suggestions? Or I'm struggling with this or whatever. Just a kind of a one-on-one -on -one uh, person to to help that out, but um, yeah, and I think it's I think you know what you said earlier, Rain, too, about like this. There's no proselytization is actually forbidden in the Baha'i faith. It's not something that we do. But what we do try to do is because we know that everyone is is out here wanting the world to actually shift. You know, people keep saying that they don't want to go back to normal because normal wasn't really working for the vast majority of people. So how do we collectively build something new that really gets us to a pace, place where we're all working together in pursuit of truth and justice, so. Well said, beautifully said. Liz, thank you so much. So glad you're a part of this. Thank everyone for, for joining. We had a really nice turnout. This was a wonderful discussion. And um, thanks to Josefina again, uh, and, and David Hoffman and the folks behind Baha'i.chat for allowing this conversation. Thank you.